warm and in the comfort of their beds. An unwelcome specter creeps through the halls of the 7-Eleven Ranch toward the room where 29-year-old Jake Millison sleeps. Little does anyone know, Jake is about to disappear without a trace. This is a small town. These things don't happen here. The local authorities are at a loss. It's like Jake Millison has just vanished into thin air. After days of unanswered calls, Jake's friends begin a frantic search for the jujitsu enthusiast, but begin to fear the worst. When people disappear the way that this kind of went down, you know that something's happened to them. A statewide hunt begins, but the truth lies closer to home than anyone suspects. Gunnison, Colorado, four hours southwest of Denver, known for being the base camp of the Rockies. This picture-perfect town of 6,600 souls is one of the state's best-kept secrets. Hunting, skiing, and snowboarding dominate the winter months, while hiking, boating, and mountain biking draw tourists in the summer. You know, when I lived in college here, I lived in houses where we didn't have a key to the house. It's that kind of a place. Um, it's, it's pretty safe, the crime rate's pretty low. I mean, I think the most crime that you deal with is domestic disturbances and stolen bikes. Several minutes outside of Gunnison, in Parlin, Colorado, is the 7-Eleven Ranch, a sprawling 700-acre property located on the western slope of the Rockies. The 7-Eleven Ranch is a labor of love for all those involved, mostly Jake, who lives in the main lodge with his mother, Deborah Rudabaugh. As a fit young man with an interest in jiu-jitsu and mixed martial arts, the bulk of the work falls onto his shoulders. Deborah begins working at the 7-Eleven Ranch in the late 1980s, after moving to the area from Ohio with Jake, her daughter Stephanie, and then-husband, Ray. It isn't long before Deborah falls in love with the ranch's owner, Marion Rudy Rudabaugh. Deborah divorces Ray, who moves to New Mexico, while she and the children stay in Gunnison. When Rudy passes away in 2009, the ranch is left to Deborah with the intention of Jake inheriting it from his mother once she's no longer able to maintain the property, which may happen sooner than anyone thinks. Deborah's health has been rapidly deteriorating for some time. Well, the ranch is valuable and people call it the $3 million ranch. Steph received $30,000 from Rudy, in addition to the $80,000 that she would have received a few years before for a down payment on a house. Now, Jake didn't receive anything, but he assumed that the ranch would become his for all his hard work. With Rudy gone, the 7-Eleven ranch falls into a state of disrepair. The family sells most of their livestock and stops hosting hunting trips which they've been holding to try to keep themselves afloat. They're barely scraping by. Needing all the help they can get, Deborah recruits Steph and her husband, Dave Jackson, to assist Jake. Being unable to offer a steady paying job to a proper ranch hand. 
Steph offers horseback riding excursions for tourists, while Dave helps with the chores, much to his displeasure. Jake and Steph haven't really gotten along, you know, very well in the past while, and that sort of translated over into his relationship with Dave. The only reason they all go to the ranch and they all work hard together is to support their mom, Deborah. Jake wants to leave the property behind, but struggles with his decision to do so. He doesn't earn an income for his work, so he's always on the lookout for odd jobs, not only to sustain himself, but the failing ranch as well. Jake picks up work cutting and selling firewood and finds a part-time gig for a landscaping company. According to his family, he also allegedly sells psychedelic mushrooms and comes up with a plan to grow and then sell marijuana to college students. Jake relishes his free time. He enjoys camping, he collects motorcycles, and he continues training in jiu-jitsu. Like, he was very dedicated to training, and um, it's kind of interesting because I don't think he had a big athletic background prior to that. It was interesting to see him kind of get with the program and understand jiu-jitsu and get pretty good at it, actually. He had a good mind for it, which is, in jiu-jitsu, it's very strategic and very leverage-based. Sometimes people who don't seem initially like they're going to be very athletic or good at it kind of have a knack for it, and, and that was Jake. He spends his hard-earned nights off at the local dive bar, enjoying the company of his lifelong friends friends that he considers his family. Well, you could always find Jake hanging out at the Alamo, uh, drinking Coke and playing pool with his buddies. Uh, they all recognized that he was just a, a great friend and he would you know, pretty much do anything for those that he cared about. He wasn't overly vocal about things. He definitely didn't talk unless he kind of knew what he was talking about. You know, it wasn't somebody to kind of project or have a lot of bravado. As he got more into the gym, he did open up more and was more talkative and stuff like that. But I think, you know, what most of his friends would say about him and what I knew of him is he was a reserved guy. But nonetheless, he came off as really intelligent. He was a very curious person. And so I think he was really into things like podcasts and um, educating himself. And he was a really smart guy. On the night of May 15th, 2015, Jake catches the late show of a movie with a friend. After the film, they make plans to hang out the following day. Little did anyone know what horrors lay ahead. Jake returns home to the place made up of his very blood, sweat, and tears. He heads into his room through the quiet lodge, where he relaxes for a few hours. He texts a friend about music sometime around 2.30 in the morning. Then, Jake turns out the lights and goes to sleep. Around 3.17 a.m., Steph, in her own home miles from the ranch, receives a mysterious text message that reads, It's time to play. Half asleep, she deletes the message and goes back to bed. In the early morning hours of May 16th, 2015, while the rest of the household slumbers, an unwelcome specter creeps down the halls of the 7-Eleven ranch with one thing on their mind ending Jake Millison's life. Like a ghost passing undetected through the halls, the unknown assailant finds their way into Jake's room, where he sleeps peacefully. Once inside, they draw their weapon, aiming it square at Jake's head, ready to take his life. But a misstep against the creaky wooden floors causes Jake to stir. As his eyes adjust to the room, it becomes painfully clear there's someone else inside the room with him. Someone with a gun. The echo of the gunshot fades, and the 7-Eleven ranch falls quiet once more.
Gunnison, Colorado. Population of just over 6,600. The small town and its surrounding counties are mostly comprised of blue collar workers. Farmers and ranchers who know the true meaning of a penny saved is a penny earned. Jake Millison is among this group, ranching alongside his mother Deborah, his sister Steph, and her husband Dave. To make ends meet, Jake also cuts wood and allegedly sells mushrooms, since the ranch doesn't provide him with an income until he inherits it. The day of May 16th, 2015, Jake Millison has plans to meet up with his friends, taking a much needed reprieve from being one of the only workers at the 7-Eleven ranch where he lives with Deborah. But when Jake doesn't show, his friends begin to worry. They've been a pretty tight-knit group of friends ever since Jake convinced Deborah that homeschooling wasn't for him. So when he doesn't show up, they know it's not like him and they believe something is wrong. After days of trying to get a hold of Jake with no response, a friend drives down to the 7-Eleven ranch to investigate for himself. There, they spot Jake's motorcycle, his most prized possession, something he would never go anywhere without. Jake's friend finds Deborah in the horse corral, working harder than ever before. He asks Deborah if she knows where Jake is. Deborah responds with some startling information. Jake is gone. He left for Reno, Nevada a few nights before to train at an MMA center. She hasn't heard from him since. Well, this strikes the friend as being odd because Jake has never been one to leave without saying goodbye, especially to his friends. Even if he was injured, he wouldn't lose contact with them. The friend presses Deborah more, inquiring as to why Jake isn't answering his phone or responding to texts. Deborah claims Jake left in a hurry. He must have forgotten his phone in all the commotion. Without much else to go on, Jake's friend reluctantly departs. His gut feeling that something is wrong remains. And it stays there for the months that follow. Jake's friends call the 7-Eleven ranch regularly, refusing to give up on Jake. But Deborah's answer is always the same. She tells them she'll let them know when she hears from him. Judging by what happened here, they were about as good of friends as you could possibly ask for. I mean, the things that they did and the way that they went above and beyond is, I've never seen anything like that. And I mean, I just hope that I have friends that are that, are that loyal to me, you know? Months pass. Jake's friends continue to call Deborah looking for updates, but get nowhere. With their anxiety regarding Jake's whereabouts growing more with every passing day, they make the decision to contact the local authorities. Well, this really isn't an open and shut case. There's so much more beneath the surface that needs to be discovered. So you have to, they have a very specific set of circumstances that need to fall into place with respect to accepting missing persons reports likely jake's mother would have been responsible for making that report and if she's not prepared to make it then they don't have an official complaint you know we have several guys who are in law enforcement that train at the gym and so when we got worried enough um, those guys were kind of the ones to make the calls and, and you know to, to use more official channels hopefully to get a better result which unfortunately i don't think really did much. Investigators call the ranch and speak with Deborah, but Deborah tells them the same information as she tells Jake's friends. She isn't concerned for his whereabouts because, according to her, he's not missing. Jake's friends refuse to believe Deborah's statement. They know their friend better than anyone. Jake's friends demand a missing persons case be opened and that an investigation into Jake's disappearance get underway immediately. But police tell them that isn't possible. Only Jake's family can open one. And with Deborah's insistence that Jake is fine, that's simply not in the cards.
Despite hitting every bump in the road, and with everyone telling them to stop searching and accept that he's gone, Jake's friends refuse to give up. They call the police in the 7-Eleven ranch so often that the authorities and Steph tell them to stop. But they don't. Yeah, those are the type of people you want in your corner when something goes bad, the ones who will have your back, so to speak. And if only one of them had been around when all this happened, maybe Jake would still be around. Jake's friends know something has happened to Jake, something nefarious. But as weeks melt into months with no leads, no evidence, and Deborah's refusal to file a missing persons report, Jake's friends begin to wonder if there isn't a sliver of truth in the idea that Jake left. In this particular case, Deborah is not prepared to report Jake missing to the police because she doesn't believe he's in any danger. She doesn't want to start an investigation. I just don't think anybody took this thing serious initially, and uh, that was very frustrating. I know that Jake's friend group was extremely frustrated because they knew something was wrong, and they were, they were positive and they were right. Basically, the, the investigating officer took her, everything she said at face value. I think there was frustration in our group that, that more wasn't being done because we knew something really bad had happened. Jake's friends remain vigilant. Even as they try to live as normal a life as possible while dedicating every free moment in their quest to find their friend. They document everything they see and hear, including motorcycles that look similar to Jake's. Hopeful that one of the leads will eventually pan out. Jake's friends maintain pressure on the local authorities. This resilience pushes the law enforcement to pay an unexpected visit to the 7-Eleven ranch. Deborah reiterates that Jake left of his own free will, that nothing suspicious is happening at the ranch. She says leaving on a whim and disappearing without a trace is common for Jake. He's done it several times before, and she's confident he'll do it again. Jake's friends admit that it's plausible Jake would leave the ranch to travel elsewhere. He's done it before, when working on a commercial fishing boat in Alaska. However, they maintain he would never leave without telling them. Well, his friends find it hard to believe, knowing Jake the way they do, that he would ever leave without saying goodbye, and that's the one sticking point for them. With nothing else to go on, local authorities let the case fall at the wayside. Jake's friends slowly begin to accept this hard reality, the past three months breaking the toughest of spirits. Then one day, the case into Jake's disappearance is given new life. Three months after Jake's friends last hear from him, his mother, Deborah, finally reports him missing. However, Deborah's filing of the report isn't all good news. She comes bearing shocking information. She insists that Jake's involvement with MMA introduced him to the wrong crowd and led him to selling drugs. She implies that he likely got in over his head and is in witness protection, in hiding, or perhaps even dead. Jake's friends could take this news two different ways. It's good news in the sense that Deborah has finally filed a missing persons report and an investigation can get underway. On the other hand, there's information that's brought forward that to them doesn't seem at all like the person they knew in Jake, uh, and they find that very disturbing. She sort of posited that he had become involved through the gym with a bunch of negative influences and that he was maybe even selling drugs or something like that. It was kind of hilarious because, you know, we have uh, students in almost every law enforcement branch in the county training with us. It just felt like we were being slandered by people who don't know us. Even with Deborah's startling revelations, Jake's friends are quick to dismiss Deborah's illegal substances claims. They know their friend. He didn't do drugs. 
Instead of dwelling on Deborah's statement, they focus their efforts on starting the Where is Jake Millison Facebook page, encouraging others to submit tips or any other information that may be useful, no matter how big or small. At the same time, local authorities reach out to Reno law enforcement for any leads. Yeah, unfortunately, the string of information leads nowhere and the authorities in Reno aren't able to locate Jake. The Facebook page grows in popularity, with hundreds of tips coming in. Jake's friends sort through every single message, relaying all the promising information to police. But nothing can be substantiated. It's another dead end. However, small pieces of the puzzle begin to come together, including one that implicates Deborah's insistence that Jake is selling mushrooms. Could that claim be true? Is it possible that a rival dealer follows him home on the night of May 15th, desperate to settle a score? Or is this a crime that hits closer to home? Two years after Jake Millison's disappearance, at the 7-Eleven Ranch, Deborah, Dave, and Steph now understand how much Jake did around the property. The three of them have been working themselves down to their bones since his disappearance, with most of the work falling on Dave. Tensions are running high, wits are at their end, Steph and Dave's marriage is at a standstill. It's around this time that Dave and a farmhand make a gruesome discovery. Is the mystery of Jake's disappearance finally going to be solved? The last time friends see Jake Millison is the night of May 15th, 2015. His friends worry for his well-being, but Jake's family claims he's run off without a trace before. It takes three months for Jake's mother, Deborah, to officially report him as missing. Yet even with the case open, the investigation is at a standstill. With no leads into his whereabouts except that he may be in Reno, Nevada, authorities are left to grasp at straws. It just didn't sound like in the realm of reality that he would do that without talking to, to me or to one of the other coaches. And so we knew that that just wasn't true. But everything changes when two years after Jake's disappearance, Dave and a farmhand uncover what looks to be a body hidden under a pile of manure on the ranch. When the couple bring their findings to Deborah, she tells them it's nothing more than a dead mountain lion, an illegal kill of Jake's that she's been hiding to avoid trouble from the police as Jake doesn't have a license. Dave is quick to agree with everything Deborah says and encourages his wife to follow. Their main concern is the ranch and they want nothing more than for their business to succeed. They decide to move the remains to another location and to not involve the authorities. Fines for hunting wildlife without a license in Colorado can reach into the thousands of dollars and that's a, an amount that Deborah could really not afford. At the same time, Jake's friends continue their tireless search. They set up a Facebook page for that very purpose, to gather tips and clues to his whereabouts. Unfortunately, nothing they forward to police can be substantiated until they stumble upon a photo that changes everything. Well, when they go to Dave Jackson's profile page, they see that he's recently changed his profile picture and now he's seen seated on a freshly painted motorcycle. And this motorcycle looks almost identical to one that Jake Millison had, uh, one that he was seen with at the hardware store. Basically, you have a guy who is an arch enemy for all intents and purposes, who now is riding around on his prized possession that anybody who knew him knew he would never let that guy touch that bike. You know, I mean, he didn't want that guy anywhere near him. I mean, he was very, very clear about that. He didn't like him. He didn't respect him. He didn't want him around. And for him to show up with that bike, it's just bafflingly stupid. 
I just, it's, I can't imagine somebody being dumber than that. The deeper investigators dig into Dave Jackson, the more they begin to uncover regarding Jake and Dave's tumultuous relationship. An incident report filed by Jake details his account of a day in 2013 when tempers flare between Dave and himself. Jake is hard at work hauling hay on his ATV when he stops to go grab a glass of water, unintentionally blocking Dave's truck. Jake reasons that he'll only be gone for a minute, so he thinks nothing of it. However, upon his return, Dave is livid, claiming that Jake is blocking his truck on purpose. The two men have a screaming match. One that Deborah and Steph try to break up. But Dave is on a rampage. He pushes Jake trying to rile him up. But Jake refuses to fight. So in one last desperate show of power, Dave reveals a gun tucked away at his hip. That very afternoon, Jake files an order of protection against Dave essentially banning him from the ranch. However, Jake withdraws the complaint days later, aware that he's unable to tend to the ranch by himself. As much as they don't get along, Jake needs Dave's help. Deborah makes a rule from that point on. The two men are not allowed to be within close proximity of each other. This seems to do the trick for a while, but the tensions between the two men never truly dissipate. Instead, they fester, building into a hatred so deep that Jake's friends don't bat a lash when they discover evidence that suggests Dave may have had something to do with Jake's disappearance. The motorcycles, the past altercations, now we have a clear motive. Did Jake flee after getting involved with the wrong crowd? Could Jake's alleged stint of selling mushrooms have put him in the crosshairs of a rival dealer? Is it possible that Jake subdues his attacker thanks to his extensive MMA training and buries the body somewhere in the vast 700 acres of the 7-Eleven ranch? Then, under the veil of night, he leaves everything behind fearful for his life and the life of his friends. With two theories and not enough evidence to back up either, the case reaches an impasse. Even Jake's friends begin to lose the hope that's been driving them for months now. Still, they remain in contact with police and maintain the Facebook page, once a hotbed for tips now mostly serving as a virtual memory book for their dear friend, whose whereabouts they may never come to find. The memory of Jake Millison begins to fade away, no matter how hard his friends fight to keep him alive. It became kind of hard to believe that it hadn't been solved or that more hadn't been done after a while and I mean it, you know kind of the years stacked up you know it took a few years to figure this out and it's one of those things that could have just faded away and you could have just been a missing person and you know everybody kind of forgets about it and moves on but thank god you know there was a group of people who stuck with it and didn't just let up I think everybody agreed that something bad had happened and that something needed to be done and it was just a question of how do you get that done and like what does that look like and fortunately his friends just just wouldn't let it go policing agencies in small towns often suffer from a lack of resources or perhaps a lack of experience in their officers so when an investigation such as a homicide investigation like this uh, needs to be undertaken, they're often 
a little overwhelmed. Um, so in this particular case, they've had to call in the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, the CBI. And at that point, that's when the investigation really kicks into high gear. Jake's friends maintain contact with the CBI in their investigation, with one agent telling them that they can't reveal much, only that their patients will be rewarded soon. Finally, in July of 2017, more than two years after Jake's disappearance, a search warrant is executed for the 7-Eleven Ranch. Search teams and cadaver dogs scour all 700 acres of the 7-Eleven Ranch with one mission in mind, find Jake Millison. Jake's friends wait with bated breath the culmination of years of searching for their missing friend possibly over should the teams find something. And find something they do. It isn't long before one of the cadaver dogs brings attention to a freshly dug hole near the horse corral. Investigators secure the scene, then they begin to dig. They uncover remains wrapped in a plastic tarp. The same remains found by Dave and moved by he and his wife Steph. Authorities quickly confirm that the body doesn't belong to a mountain lion. The family advises authorities that the skeleton is a mountain lion that Jake had presumably killed. A forensic pathologist would be able to defer that quite quickly. There are certainly some clear differences here. But whose body is it? The unknown assailants or Jake Millicent's? Jake Millicent has been missing for over two years. His family doesn't seem to care, but his friends, his chosen family, haven't given up. It's their determination that leads to a search warrant being executed at the 7-Eleven Ranch, Jake's home that he shares with his mother. When a body is found on the property, the worst fears of Jake's friends are confirmed. The body belongs to Jake. Authorities tell the family the news. Steph, Jake's sister, seems to take it the hardest. Though it's only a month or two before her husband Dave stumbles upon what Deborah claims is a mountain lion buried under the manure pile in the horse corral. A fact they fail to mention to investigators until later. The 357 caliber bullet that was recovered within his skull was believed to be shot at a close range. It was definitely a break in the case that the bullet was still lodged within the skull. When investigators were at the scene, they recovered a revolver that matched using the 357 bullet. Given that Jake's body is found on the ranch, authorities are able to pinpoint that Jake's murderer is likely one of his family members. They begin questioning Dave, Steph, and Deborah separately. The CBI circles Dave, the tension between him and Jake, the altercation where Dave brandishes a weapon, and the fact that Dave's been seen around town driving Jake's motorcycle seems to make him their main suspect. But Dave is adamant he has no involvement. The scenario of Dave, you know, potentially sneaking into the ranch and killing Jake uh, can't be substantiated. The same goes for the theory of a rival drug dealer. Really, they have no evidence to proceed any further and they're really at a standstill. Even with the discovery of Jake's body and a possible suspect within their grasp, the case remains unsolved. It isn't until March of 2018 when a shocking confession breaks the mystery of Jake's death wide open. No one could anticipate what happens next.
Deborah tells investigators everything and confesses to murdering her own son. Deborah returns home the night of May 15, 2015, after a full shift at her day job, only to discover the task she's asked Jake to do is incomplete. She claims she's always on Jake's case, asking him to clean up and help out around the inside of the ranch, but that he often shirks his duties. This incomplete task is her last straw. Deborah snaps. She waits until her son returns home, allowing her rage to consume her. Deborah and Jake have been fighting nonstop over who would inherit the ranch after Deborah's passing. She indicates that he's been violent with her and that he's hanging out with the wrong crowd, and ultimately says that she really just didn't feel safe in her own home. Deborah ultimately made the decision to take Jake's life. Then, in the early morning hours of May 16th, 2015, Deborah Rudabo takes her revolver, goes into her sleeping son's room, and shoots him in the head. killing him instantly. She claims to have then wrapped his body in a plastic tarp and dragged him outside, where she uses toe straps and a winch attached to an ATV to drive him out to the body's original location, under the manure pile in the horse corral. The details that she gives police in her confession are extremely specific, not only about how she killed her son, but also about how she disposed of the body. So certainly it shows intent and is enough to uh, justify a charge of first degree murder. Investigators believe they have their murderer, but her story leaves others questioning her motives. She wasn't a big lady. Um, you know, Jake was, you know, 175, 170 pounds. It just doesn't seem to me like a, a frail older woman is going to be able to do those things by herself. She underwent gallbladder surgery nine days prior. She's claiming that nine days post gallbladder surgery, she murdered her 170 pound MMA fighting son, Jake, and moved his body all by herself. It's inconceivable that that's actually what happened. Even Jake's father, Ray Millison, tells police that no matter how bad the situation may have been, he couldn't see Deborah killing her own son. With Deborah's health failing by the hour, is it possible she's protecting the actual murderer? When investigators tell Steph Jackson about her mother's confession, the young woman breaks down sobbing. But police aren't fooled. Police find a social media post made by Steph around the time of Jake's murder, saying, Have you been woken up with such awesome news you wanted to run outside screaming? That post, along with a failed polygraph test, give investigators the leg up in the case that they've been looking for. In this case, the CBI becomes involved, and an agent testifies in court that while Deborah didn't have anything to gain from Jake's death, Stephanie did because she would gain control of the ranch. You got to think there's a financial motive somewhere in there. Um, I think that's generally why people do things like this. Maybe there's long-term rivalry in there as well, you know, that, that somebody was willing to just go too far with and to be involved in the death of, you know, somebody who you grew up with and you've known your whole life or you raised. Or, that's a whole different level of thinking. Armed with this evidence, police question Steph. She plays forgetful at first but eventually tells authorities her side of the story. One that starts with Dave's discovery of the remains of the alleged mountain lion, which they moved to a new location. The story appears to be fabricated to make Steph and Dave seem innocent in Jake's murder, when in fact they're anything but. 
Stephanie admits that her and Dave assisted Deborah in moving Jake's body. So they're charged with tampering with a dead body. In late 2019, more than four years after Jake Millison's disappearance, his mother Deborah, sister Stephanie, and brother-in-law Dave all face charges relating to his murder. Dave Jackson pleads guilty to one count of tampering with a deceased human body. He receives a 10-year sentence and will be eligible for parole in 2023. Stephanie Jackson pleads guilty to a single count of tampering with a dead body. She receives the maximum sentence of 24 years in prison and will be eligible for parole in 2029. Deborah Rudabo pleads guilty to second-degree murder and receives a 40-year sentence. She dies in prison in November of 2019. Many people believe she takes the fall because she knows she's dying. But whether she pulled the trigger or not, nobody really knows for sure. It's a secret she takes to her grave. I could see a world where a mother, upon losing one child in violent circumstances, might still protect the other child and might still want to ensure that that child has some life left. been processed normally.